Welcome, everybody. Sorry I've got my back to a couple of people here, but welcome to all of you. We didn't expect standing room only, Chris. This, I just, this is unprecedented in the PhD defense of standing room only, sir. You should be flattered. <laughs> I'll let the flattery sink in when the, when the morning's over. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let me just explain what's going on. My name is Laurie Anderson, and uh, I'm here as in the formal role as the chair of this committee, the PhD defense committee. In real life, I'm the executive director of this campus of SFU and an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Education. So I want to welcome all of you, including those of you behind me, to this event this morning, and particularly to you, Chris, in your capacity here this Thank morning you. as well. So uh, I also want to acknowledge as a small step, we say, towards reconciliation, I want to acknowledge that our campus, and we have nine locations in the downtown campus of SFU, all of it is on the traditional historical lands, unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples. So welcome to all of you. So let me mention the people who are involved and make a few introductions, and then we will um, we will get rolling. Uh, I would, is Harleen there? Is, is, oh, can he can he hear me? She, she would need a mic. She part, here. Oh, I see. So Harleen's on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Harleen. Good morning. Uh, Doctor Dr. Anderson, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, you may call me Harleen if you prefer. No, I like the Doctor Anderson because that's my name too. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Harleen. Uh, it's pleased to meet you at least by by audio. Uh, Dr. Harleen Anderson is from the Taos Institute and serves as Chris's external examiner. So Harleen, I'm just going through the committee and I just want to welcome you to the process this morning. Well, thank you. All right. And uh, I'll just put this aside for the moment. I hope you can hear. All right. Uh, the chair of the committee is Dr. Heisun Bai. And if you could just ask the members to raise their hand as I point them out. Dr. Heisun Bai is the chair. The internal external examiner is Dr. Charles Scott, also from the Faculty of Education. And Alan McKinnon is a member of the committee from the Faculty of Education as well. So here's how this, we have a formal process we go through here. And let me just quickly go through it. Uh, Chris has an opportunity to present, usually 20, 25 minutes or so. I was told 30. Oh, 30 is then. Let's make it 30. Because <laughs> we usually say you've got five minutes plus or minus, so if 30 If you are per continuing to talk, I'm not hearing anything. Okay, this, can you hear me now, Harleen? He's, he's using my mic. I can, yes. Okay, thank you. So we'll, we'll have to work this mic, and uh, I'll return it to Chris as he starts speaking. So what I'm doing is just going over the logistics. I've just introduced the committee, who I believe you know the other people, and we have, we were all given a copy of your review already of... Uh, Chris's PhD, and uh, the other members I mentioned already, you know who they are, of course, Dr. Alan McKinnon, Dr. Heisun Bai, and Dr. Charles Scott. And I was just outlining to Chris the process. He will have 30 minutes to do his presentation, and then we have a sequence of asking questions, which I'll have to ask Dr. Bai to just remind me, or Dr. Scott, the sequencing of questioning. Who's the first to ask the question? Uh, Dr. Dr. Harleen Anderson. Do yes, so uh, Dr. Harleen Anderson, you will be first to ask the questions. And, and Dr. then Scott. the internal. And then Dr. Scott. And then Dr. Mack. And I'm the last. Okay. All right. And we'll go, we'll have a couple of rounds of questions, Chris, as we normally do at that time. And then after that, uh, every, any and all of you here have an opportunity to ask a question. And that's part of the process. We want to make this as open as possible. So anything you wish to ask Chris about anything he says, please take the opportunity. And at the end of that, at the end of that proceeding, what we do at that time, we ask you all to leave the room, including Chris. And what happens then is, along with Dr. Anderson on the phone, we then uh, deliberate and make a discussion around what the decision is at the end of that. And at that time, we ask you back in, we make the announcement, and that's the end of the process. All right. So that's the plan. And Chris, if I could give you this back so that when you start your... Okay. Well, you... Yeah. Apparently I've got this one. Okay. All right. I'll go this way. So, uh, Harleen, we're about to start. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. I hear you. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Take We're it ready? away. Um, I want to start by talking about my hat. I've got two feathers on this hat. One is a young eagle, and the other is a barred owl. A year, over a year ago now, um, I wore this hat to Stahela's First Nation, and an elder and an artist there named Rocky Larock said, Kinman, I want your hat. So I gave him my hat, and he came back a number of minutes later with these two feathers on. And uh, that year, uh, just months pre previously, I had lost uh, my mentor, Lynn Hoffman, who died uh, in uh, <coughs> December, over a year ago now. And I'd also lost my father, and so he put these on so I could keep their spirits alive. And uh, it also means a lot to me. So since he's done this, I've been wearing this hat pretty much every day, as my, my daughter over there will uh, begrudgingly admit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are a number, before I get into the actual presentation, I uh, also want to recognize that this land we're upon is, um, was never ceded, and there are three particular nations, actually probably four, that, uh, who, whose land this is, this belongs to. That's the Musqueam, the Squamish, the tsleil and some people don't know this, but Stolo also claims much of uh, Vancouver as well. I also, though, want to give particular thanks to um, Stahelis First Nation, where my heart lies and much of my work lay. I worked there for, I think, 26, 27 years, and I just recently moved to the Okanagan, so I'm not there anymore. Um, Stahelis First Nation. Um, uh, the Stolo, and uh, Valerie, let's see if I get it right. Um, Stadlium, is that close enough? Uh, and particularly, um, Choistin? Uh, Twiston, first name, uh, community, uh, where, where Valerie's from, and uh, we'll hear more from her later. Um, in preparing this presentation, um, there's some images that have been really important for me. And uh, those of you who know me will know these images. And um, one of them is the image of the rhizome, which is underground network of uh, nodes and lines. I first received this image uh, reading uh, Deleuze and Guattari probably 30 years ago now. And uh, it's been very important for me and for my work. But um, with that in mind, I felt very inco inconsistent in just talking up here today. So I've asked uh, six people to take about three minutes each and to share about their connection with some ideas that are within the, uh, within the dissertation. Because um, I don't know, if, I mean, for me, this isn't about me apparently feels like that way right now, but, um, um, but in real, real life it isn't. It's about webs of relationship that sustain us and holding on to these and, and, and making use of them and not just using them, but, uh, but uh, realize that they sustain us into life. Right? Um, with that in mind, um, let me just uh, take care of this. Okay. This is the uh, title of my dissertation, The River Carries That Which the Mountains Cannot Hold. That phrase came from an event with my mentor, Lynn Hoffman, and we were down by the Fraser River um, right around Abbotsford and Mission many years ago, decades ago now. And uh, the saying came to us. And afterwards, she thought I made, up, made it up, and I thought she made it up. It came to us both. 
the river carries that which the mountains cannot hold, and the implication that uh, the flow of life, the flow of the river, the flow of all things related to life, um, are able to do much more than those things that are solid and fixed. Um, I want to start with a quote from Bruno Latour. And uh, Bruno Latour wrote a wonderful book, it's at the bottom there, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, an Anthropology of the Mo Moderns. But it was an unusual book because it was kind of a fiction. He had an anthropologist that was um, fic fictitious and walked us through this, uh, what it means to be modern. And uh, so it's a very unusual uh, document. And at one point, uh, this fictitious uh, anthropologist walks into a town square and she is expecting to have lots of conversation because what's happening in the world is very serious. And she expects to see and hear lots of activity. And this is what Latour said. And there, what is she told? Nothing and no one decides. It suffices to calculate. The very place where everything must be decided and discussed, since these are the matters of life and death for everyone and everything, appears to be a public square entirely emptied of all its protagonists. In it she finds only the incontrovertible result of unchallengeable deductions made elsewhere, away from the agora. It is no longer the difference between extreme heat and extreme cold that stuns here, but the difference between the fullness, the agitation, the commotion she expected, and the emptiness, the silence, the absence of all those who are concerned first and foremost. This whole vast engine apparently functions on autopilot. Here, where everyone must decide, no one seems to have a hand in. And he's suggesting that while we expect to have lots of conversation because of the needs of our world these days, she finds the opposite. She finds everyone has calculated answers and the conversations are stopped. Deleuze also had a, another concern with um, the relations that are required for us to move forward. But we, we live at the, very, at the very most in a logic of relations. We turn disjunction into an either or. We turn connection into a relation of cause and effect or a principle of consequence. We abstract a reflection from the physical world of flows. A bloodless, a bloodless double made up of subjects, objects, predicates, and logical relations. In this way, we extract the system of judgment. But whenever a physical relation is translated into logical relations, a symbol into images, flows into segments, exchanged, cut up into subjects and objects, we have to say that the world is dead. It's a pretty harsh statement. You know, coming from Deleuze, uh, probably in the 60s or 70s, and um, the need to enter a world where relationships are truly appreciated and truly honored, not just in a side way. It's not easy for us to do. I have attempted to do that in this disser dissertation, and part of it comes from the realization that the river, and many people can insert the river that they're close to, but for me it was the Fraser River, is a place of gathering, a place of confluences, a place where voices and bodies come together, a place where the human and the non-human or the post-human come together. And for me, that's what I was attempting to tap into, to move with. Um, so I have six voices today here, and I've asked each one to give about three minutes. I'm going to ask you to stay close to the three minutes <laughs> because of the time. Um, uh, I'll be honest with you, in asking six, I, I was sure that there would only be three or four, 
that would be able to come. And all six have come, and I'm grateful. Uh, but because of that, we need to stay within the, uh, within the um, three minutes. First person, <clears throat> and these people are all going to talk about something that they connect with related to this dissertation. The first person is not here. It's Colin Sanders, uh, uh, recently retired from City University. My City University people tend to be retiring, it seems like. Um, and I've got him on video. So here's Colin. Greetings, Chris. Thank you for asking me to be a part of this dialogue in regards to uh, your composition. You're, uh, you're a very um, erudite, uh, if I may say so, um, dissertation. It's a lovely composition. Um, I love the metaphors you're working with and the uh, confluences and uh, multiple streams of ideas that uh, run through the work you're doing. It's um, challenging to uh, give you some uh, reflections and thoughts in, uh, uh, in three minutes or less. But um, I've read the work that you've been writing uh, over the last uh, year or so. I've read different versions of it. I really appreciate um, the, um, the, uh, the labor and the thinking that you put into it. Um, it's, it's uh, I think, um, uh, an intellectually challenging piece of work and in terms of pedagogy, I think you're asking some very important uh, questions in terms of uh, learning and how we learn and how knowledge uh, need to be uh, compartmentalized and uh, the rhizomatic uh, uh, kind of um, event that happens when, um, when ideas uh, commingle in that respect. So um, thank you. Again, I'm in uh, the Kootenays and that's uh, um, West Kootenay Lake behind me, and um, yesterday I was at my son's place um, uh, following a stream up to the um, to, to where the water falls and uh, <coughs> where he gets his drinking water. And uh, so we were uh, talking about um, you know how remarkable it is to uh, have this uh, connection, this ecological connection, something that you're concerned about environmentally in your work. And uh, the idea of um, listening to the land, listening to the water, and uh, deriving uh, peace and uh, community and thoughtfulness uh, from those experiences. So thanks again. Um, wishing you all the best uh, for your Evo um, today. And um, looking forward to catching up. That was nice. Take care. Fight the power. Bye-bye. <laughs> Those of you who know Colin, that's his uh, saying, fight the power. Maika, you're next. Maika is a colleague of mine at City University, but we have another connection. We were both born on the same continent. I was born in, in Africa, and I think that's made some sense of that. Uh, something's there that connects us. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Horizonic River. Uh, I have known Chris for a number of years, and we have often exchanged ideas of all kinds of subjects, including the African philosophy of uh, Ubuntu. Mm. The Ubuntu term means humanity, and is often translated as I am because we are, or humanity towards others. In fact, the Luba language uses expressions such as Muntu wa Bantu and Bantu wa Muntu, which can be uh, translated into the human kind, uh, the human being for the human kind, and the human kind for the human being. The more philosophical uh, sense for me, the belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects uh, all humanity. This connectivity principle echoes Chris's geophilosophy that includes the assemblage of land and thought, ecology, and history. My new personal association to this particular journey can be summarized in three impressions. The first one is the river pilgrimage uh, that took me back to my own childhood, mm -hmm. while it is on the Congo River mm -hmm. and its tributaries. My family and I spent countless hours on my father's ship that was holding cargo 
to remote and often inaccessible uh, areas of the country. At the time, I didn't know that uh, Joseph Conrad had written uh, describing the Congo as the heart of darkness in his novel uh, with the same title. Uh, and he, he said this by, uh, when he was talking about the genocide committed by uh, King Leopold II uh, of Belgium envoys on the Congolese uh, people. I was not aware that there would be additional violence caused by valuable minerals, extracts such as gold, diamonds, and cotton. Though, too, uh, the shelter lenses of my childhood, I gazed at the thousand shades of greens. Um, that was, that, for me, a vast cathedral uh, with a tropical rainforest. And I also marveled in uh, discovering wildlife and all the ways of being. So, although the Congo River had existed for millions of years, but it was so-called discovered for the Western world when, uh, in 1482, Diego Cao arrived in the country. So he mistook the name Zadi, that means river, and I thought it was the name of the, uh, the, the, the country itself. That's why it ended up being called Zaire uh, down the line. The second concept is the one of the horizon, the map, that the horizon represents in terms of history and culture. Um, so the Congo River has a unique horizon in that sense. It has uh, 4,799 kilometers in, in, in length. Its basin covers four million kilometers squares, and the river itself uh, represents about 13% of African mass land. So at times, the, the width is eight, uh, 800 meters and sometimes 16 kilometers. So it covers over 10 African countries, actually, mm. including Angola, Burundi, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Congo Brazzaville, mm. EIC, Gabon, and Rwanda, Tanzania, and Zambia as well. It has tons of islands and waterfalls, and has been a major source of survival for millions of people uh, through its passing. Of course, the river has also a historical, economical, and utilitarian and ecological value, not only for the Congo, but also for the other countries around it. So by virtue of navigation, it has sustained most of the trade in the Central African uh, area, uh, distributing crash crops such as uh, copper, palm, palm oil, sugar, coffee, or cotton. Lastly, in a recent trip to Calgary, uh, about mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, I was at the confluence of the bull and the elbow mm -hmm. river. Uh, the site that has uh, been a historical and cultural gathering based for indigenous people for thousands of years. I discovered that the original name of Calgary was working thesis according to black, the Blackfoot tradition. I also learned about the real people from an elder describing those who respect life and the land and was reminded of the Ubuntu, Ubuntu concept mm. that I previously mentioned. This encounter had me deepen my understanding of the human rhizomic connection. Like this is uh, Fraser River, my Congo River, or the bow and the elbow, these bodies of water have been gathering places and vehicles trickling into new direction for millennia and will continue to do so for a very long time. Thank you, Chris, for making me part of this special journey. Thank you, Monica. Drew Moore. Um, Drew and I have worked closely together for far too long. <laughs> and I would be gladly to work more with him for far too long in the future, too. Um, we've been through many times together, and um, We've wrestled with the, the work of human services and trying to come to grips with what that means and what can be done with it, and often with great frustration as well, great loss at times. 
but Drew and I walked together through much of that. And so I've asked Drew if he could share, and he's been working really hard to keep it under three minutes. And I'm going to turn it over to my dear friend. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, my introduction to Chris was in a care team meeting for a particularly challenging young man. Chris had been contracted to develop uh, an assessment and uh, a proposed care plan for the adolescent. I um, don't know how many of you have seen those. They're generally pretty useless because they generally want to express the cleverness of the author as opposed to the needs of the person that are being assessed. So as I get reading into this, what I realize is it looks like it was written by a high school student. And I'm like, oh, great. And then I start to realize that what Chris had managed to do in plain English language, which if you're in the human services field is a rare commodity, actually articulated who this young man was. So that we were able to understand his occurring world and thus we had a better sense of who this young man was. Through our, through our time together and through various arguments and discussions, uh, Chris has been able to articulate a number of um, concepts, but the one that I'm most enamored with is a concept of smooth versus striated spaces. Smooth spaces are what are developed when natural processes are allowed to unfold without our interference. A river where geography, water, gravity, and soil density determines its course. The language and rituals of love and decades-long marriages. And late-night conversations around campfires are all smooth spaces. Smooth spaces can be messy. They are hard to predict and even, and, and even harder to control. Strided spaces, on the other hand, occur when outside influences people interfere in that natural process. Think of suburbs with our roads, property lines, and zoning bylaws. Think of a care team meeting for an at-risk youth that, have, that sets a list of goals, outcomes, and deliverables. In turn, these are based on this creative belief that human growth is a linear process. Religions that attempt to control much of the human services are remnants of what our religions have been. Strider spaces are marked by a number of things, an, ideal, an idealized model, model of what should be, a desire for certainty, and I would say more an addiction for certainty, rigid lines of what is right and what is wrong, what is yours and what is mine, what is healthy and what is unhealthy, and an excessive amount of energy managing the encroachment, if not the insurgency, of smooth spaces. Smooth spaces are marked by development within relationship. And if you think about the bison of the Great Plains, these were animals that learned how to live in relationship to the land. They knew when it was time to seek shelter in river valleys, when it was time to come out um, onto the Great Plains. They lived in relationship with the weather and geography of the time. Smooth spaces tend to be very stable, much to the chagrin of those people in favor of striated spaces. The accommodation of what at times could be considered oppositional or destructive forces. One of the things that we're running into currently is our lack of understanding that small fires within our forests were a natural part of their growth and development. So we see what we think is a destructive force that actually within the forest leads to its overall health. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Arden. Arden yes. Hanley was uh, our leader at City University and uh, <coughs> recently retired. And um, I'm going to just let you talk. <laughs> Well, thanks, Chris, and thanks for this precious opportunity. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed uh, looking around the room because I can see that um, 
I'm probably the only one who printed the document. <laughs> <laughs> and then had to carry it. Down I did here. too. <laughs> <laughs> However, you know, it was a thing. I, it, I, not only did I want to see it, but I wanted to touch it and I wanted to hold it. So here it is. Uh, my um, response, Chris, is entitled Down by the Riverside. Mm. Then, Mary and I arrive at the end of the Arbutus Greenway, where the neatly paved walkway reverts to railway tracks, the place where industry meets wildness, where blackberry bushes take over vacant lots, where lots of new cars are stashed, where the damp air of an estuary soothes the body-mind. And I have come to think of the Fraser River as your guide, your companion, your inspiration, restoring balance, invoking mystery, teaching that memory is located and that mind and nature are one. Thank you, Arden. See that? I went, thank you, Arden. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking into the clicker rather than the <laughs> But thank you, indeed. Ward. First met Ward a couple of years ago. If you read my dissertation, you'll recognize his name, Ward Draper. Um, I have a history where I was a Christian pastor. I left that behind me. Ward is a Christian pastor, but he's given me hope. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I completely knew he was going to say that. But <laughs> completely knew that. And um, out in Abbotsford, uh, he, he has turned Abbotsford into a place often known for conservative views into a place where something powerful is happening. I'm just going to turn it over to you. See, I did it again. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, in response to the thesis, the big thing that me and Chris have spent the last couple of years talking about and uh, I'm working on developing actually in towards from uh, my graduate thesis uh, is the idea of perichoresis. Uh, if anyone's familiar with that here, anybody? Okay, <laughs> let's, get, let's go back 2,000 years. Perichoresis is a concept found within early Christian tradition that talks about the relationship of the Trinity, God, Christ, and the Spirit, but it's highly transferable to us as humans. And so looking at the way to create, similar to smooth spaces and such, paracritic spaces. So in the idea of the perichoresis, the individuals of the Trinity empty themselves to fully partake and reflect each other. So we can do that as well as as, as humans, that we can move together like the river in a dance where we see each other equally, equally created, equally connected, moving together, filling ourselves and making space for the other to increase our capacity for healing, for education, to take care of what we see in the world. And so the church has spent its time trying to create spaces for itself. The ancient church tried to create paracritic spaces we are seeing a movement to reclaim that, law, um, that idea within ecclesial settings. But I believe it's much more valuable if we can find a way to move it into our communities, into the way we dialogue and interact. It's very similar to Ubuntu, right? It's very similar to that. It's a tradition I've always respected and, and followed within our church. Uh, but I see there's a connectivity in there is where we can make the space for each other to open the dialogue to move like the river does, with the power to create change. Right? And so that's where me and Chris have spent the last couple of years really chewing on is how do we move together and move together well, making space for each other and recognizing that each one of us is equal and that we all have a share in this story together. And these ideas are not just ideas, Ms. Ward. Um, Ward's work 
finds homes for people that don't have a bed to sleep in. Uh, every day he feeds his group, uh, feeds the homeless, and he does it, by the way, working with the Sikh community as well. Um, and so my respect for his work comes from uh, that it's deeply embedded, embedded on the ground with the people that are most suffering. One quick story. Um, one day, Ward took me on a trip with his car. It was, it, uh, it was shortened because his car broke down. <laughs> but um, he went on this, took me on this trip around Abbotsford to show me where vulnerable people have died. And he told me their names, told me their stories, and we remembered them. And we've often talked about how we can make that more of a remembrance. The first person he, to he took me to and showed me the place was a young man named Louis Sam. Any of you heard of this name? I'll tell it real quick. Uh, you, you, you can tell it real uh, quick. Uh, Louis Sam, quick history, uh, was the only known racially motivated lynching in Canadian history. And it happened in Abbotsford. Uh, the, the boy was about 14. He was from the uh, Stolo uh, nation. And he was wrongly accused and set up for a murder of a, a fellow sh a shop owner across the US lines. And then church groups on both sides of the line got together to conspire to make him the, the, the scapegoat for the scenario. Uh, and they just took him and, and hung him, which uh, in, in what now became Abbotsford, a couple of years later became actually Abbotsford. Uh, and Louis uh, is barely remembered by anybody. Even in our city, there's a, a, a cenotaph marker down by the spot where he was murdered, and you could take his name out of the story and it wouldn't affect the narrative whatsoever. Uh, it's a part of our history, I think, is really important uh, that we've forgotten, because, yeah, it is the only racially known mode of uh, lynching in Canadian history compared to the U.S. 5,000 plus. Uh, so it's a valuable piece of our history that we, we just piss on. Valerie. Um, one of the ideas about rhizome I like is I think a word that goes along with rhizome is friendship. Not a hierarchical kind of relationship, but friendship. And I've learned to value that. And it's been a privilege to call you my friend. Valerie is a, a, a leader with her people and she's a particular leader in the field of education. If you uh, read uh, my dissertation, there's a a chapter where um, Valerie is very present and her work that she does up uh, near Lillooet, Bridge River, um, um, is highlighted. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, Valerie. Hello, everybody. My name is Anna Pukwis. It means the, the name that was heard around the world. My, my sister likes to remind me that uh, the name that was spoken around the world, and she goes, sometimes it might be in vain, sister. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she brings me back to earth. But uh, what I want to talk today about is uh, what, what uh, strikes me in this dissertation is everything is a lesson. Indigenous way of learning focuses on the power of place or learning from not only where you are physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually as well. My parents, my mother a teacher with her masters, and my father who was a chief during my formative years and a carpenter by trade, stressed to us the importance of education. But they did not focus on what on just book smarts. We were also taught that everything is a lesson. Our family loved music and singing along with the LPs, and our father sang around the campfire. We were tasked with writing those songs for him. There we were, sprawled out on the floor, listening, writing, repeating words we did not understand, and had to ask, how do you spell crystal? To be told, look it up. Done, okay. How do you spell chandelier? What is a chandelier? Two words going to us because our family just acquired running water and electricity. It took us a while to find chandelier in the dictionary, as you can imagine, but we did it. This is one simple story that stuck with me. Dad and Mom knew that by doing it, Whatever it was, we would learn. We, uh, we had hooked on phonics records, Encyclopedia Britannica, dictionaries. I know some, some of the young folks may not know what these are, but and books of every kind in our house. From an early age, we were taught to take care of each other, to figure out solutions and ask questions. 
Much of what we learned was through playing with our siblings, family, and friends, and most importantly, on the land by just living. Or to put it another way, living our way of life. We never were taught the ABCs or 123s at home, but we learned it from the books, toys, dictionaries, and songs. He's here to help me. <laughs> um, dictionaries and songs. I read a book on law at age eight with the dictionary and encyclopedia on hand. We were taught on the land about fishing, how to watch for ecological indicators, the shape of the horse on the mountainside in Lillooet. That tells us get the fish camp ready. The buttercups are out. That means the spring salmon are running. Wild roses are blooming. The first run of sockeye are in the Fraser River. And we can only can the first run of sockeye because they're too oily to wind dry, which we do there. We wind dry our salmon. Yeah. And uh, when, how we knew that we could wind dry our salmon is when we, when we heard that clicka clicka. And the clicka clicka is the grasshopper. That's the sound they make when they're flying. And it's hot enough and windy enough to dry. So those are ecological indicators that we use uh, as we're growing up. And that's what we've learned on the land. This is what I, what I mean when, when I talk about focusing on the gifts. And this is an idea brought forward again into my thinking by, by Chris. Uh, and this is how I, I like to uh, focus on the students in, in our care, in our, in our Head Start daycare. What are they interested in? Where is their place physically, emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually? Encourage that. As indicated in the dissertation, the current way of utilizing the curriculum does not work for for best for most Indigenous students. My earliest learning was based on living with guidance from our network, but beginning with my parents encouraged me where I was at, and as my mother always said, take the positive and move forward with it, and learn from the, learn from, but leave the negative. Thank you. No, 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 thank you. <laughs> yeah. Inside joke. <laughs> the rest of you, some of you will get it. Um, Ward introduced me to this image. Um, when the Europeans came out to the, this land, uh, Christianity was pushed onto this land and on, on its people. I think we need to revisit this Christianity and uh, not the one that was pushed onto the land, but another one. And. Um, we have to go back to the year 1054, when there was a split in the church between the West and the East. When we talk in our in academia about East and West, we often think of East as being, uh, as being Asia. But the real East and West in our tradition comes from that split. This image is cut off from the West, it comes from the East. It comes from Russia, it was by an artist named Andrei Rublev and I want you to have a look at the Holy Trinity. Are they male or are they female? Or are they something else? Um, there's three of them there, but there's a space at the front and there's in the, between them there's some food or some drink. But you notice underneath the food or the drink, there's a little square. Uh, Ward helped me learn this, that the belief is that in the old days they put a mirror there. So the Holy Trinity from the East that this image is presenting, there's no big, big male figure. And there's a fourth, there's a three plus one. And that one is every living creature. It's you, me, it's the salmon, it's the river. It's, it's every living identity that there is, is in that fourth place. A trinity made of three plus one. And um, in the West, there was a different image of God, a very male, masculine image. Um, and Adam also, as man. Notice that the women and, and the children are all behind uh, this image of God the Father. A very, very kind of strong masculine tradition. It's not here in this image. I think we need to revisit our own traditions. 
I know there's been efforts to try to um, um, to try to bring in uh, indigenous traditions. My concern with that is that the indigenous traditions are taken over by Western Christian traditions, and I think we have to revisit our own history and our, the own, our own scars, their own split that goes back to 1054 and realize that there's a whole other side that we need to revisit and, uh, and, and come to understand it, not just in its religious ways, but in its secular ways as well. That's all I had to say. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, I think it deserves a round of applause for you. I think you had so much to say, so uh, kudos for your time management. How long was it? Uh, just kudos for your time management. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Anderson, are you still with us? Yes. Yes. I'm here. So, I'll just remind everyone in the audience that Dr. Anderson, the process is we have a series of questions from four people on the committee, then you'll have the second round of questions. Then there will be an opportunity for any of you to ask first questions, and then we will proceed to the next stage. So, Dr. Anderson, you're first up to ask your question. Okay, first a, a comment. I would like to say that I think this piece of work, this dissertation, is an extremely uh, creative piece of work, uh, beginning obviously with the title and the methodology, and it's a beautiful exemplification of the webs of relationships that uh, Christopher Kinman is trying to uh, share with the readers. So a question is, though a uniqueness of the dissertation project in its written form is in its demonstration of the interrelatedness of theory or conceptual framework and practice or methodology of inquiry and writing, it puts theory and practice uh, into action and what I'm wondering is what kind of skepticism or critique do you, Chris, imagine or anticipate from those in the academy who favor more traditional quantitative approaches uh, to research? And I'm wondering how you will respond to these, and particularly not a response that hopes to clarify it or change their minds for them, but to help encourage others who want to do um, a creative, who want to approach research from a creative perspective. Thank you, Harleen. Um, that's a big question. There's a lot in and that it, it question. Is. Um, but I think an important one is as you position your yes. work within a broader right. context. Um, and, and, and some of this I've already encountered, some of the uh, um, critique of this I've already encountered. Um, some people call my dissertation non-traditional. My response to that is, uh, depends on the tradition. Um, and uh, I, I feel that there is a, a strong tradition that's uh, behind what I'm doing. It, it's certainly not a tradition that's valued when I co coming from human services, which is dominated by psychology. Certainly not there. And I think some those that are really coming from that tradition um, don't know what to do with this, or or maybe they do know what to do with this, but uh, usually they won't read it. Um, it's a 250 pages of reading what they wouldn't agree with. So, um, um, but I, I'm not, I didn't do this to be non-traditional. I did this to follow a tradition. And that tradition includes, um, um, well, it goes way back, but it also includes uh, Gilles Deleuze and, and, and um, Jacques Derrida. Uh, my dear friend Lynn Hoffman, my friends here that spoke today, other friends as well. Um, and I, I feel that it's important for, for us to revalue 
uh, well, let me put it this way, to revalue the arts and not just the sciences. And to, re to realize that there are traditions of thought that have formed us uh, for the good or for the bad. And um, those traditions of thought still form us. And I wanted to kind of follow those traditions. Um, when I was a child, I wanted to be a scientist, but then I, and a naturalist in particular, but then I discovered that apparently you needed to be good at math for that. So I went somewhere else. <laughs> and, um, um, but where we can understand that our experiences of life, our experiences of our work, are, are not all things that are calculated you know, that can be measured and calculated, but are, are much more than that. Um, there are many who believe that everything of importance can be calculated. I think they're mistaken. I'm not opposed to calculations. I'm not opposed to that kind of a thing. But I didn't want to do that. And I made effort within this to not use economic language, to not use psychological language, uh, but to try to be as close as we could but by talking about our relations with the earth and more specifically with the river and more specifically with the Fraser River and its watershed. And I have come to believe that many of these issues are resolved when we focus upon the land and the water and let the land and the water organize our thesis instead of some abstract uh, um, idea that's removed from the land and the water. Uh, that many of the difficulties that people might have with this are dissipated also because, uh, because we are connected to the realities of our land and to the, to the flows of this river. And it changes the dialogue. I don't know if that helps, Harleen, if that answers uh, your question, or if it just went somewhere else? I, I think that it helps. It also reminds me of your six guests and their voices, and the importance that if you're going to be in a different stream or create a new stream, or if you want to call it a new tradition, tradition in quotes, uh, the importance of having conversational partners or a network of somewhat like-minded people who are obviously, your guests are all yeah. extremely uh, creative. Well, yes, and, and, and um, to me it's all about our relations. It all is, you mm -hmm. know, even if we're counting numbers, it's about relations. Um, and there's no other way, I don't think, to really uh, talk about these things without honoring those relationships. That's why the, uh, the rhizome image was so important to me. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. We will return to you afterwards. Dr. Scott. Okay. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Great to see you. Good to see you, Charles. So, oh, yes, the microphone. Um, come on, right over. Come on over. Share my I can so, do that. I can come like this. We can do this. <laughs> so, so I just want to start off. It's called cozying up to your <laughs> committees. Feel free, feel free to give them some space. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, yeah, cozying up. What a concept. Why not? Huh? Why not? And, and that, so, so before I get back to that mm -hmm. point, let me acknowledge that this is a beautifully written dissertation. Thank some you. gloriously lyrical writing in there. And I use the word lyrical mm -hmm. on purpose. Um, <laughs> you include many songs um, yeah. about rivers. Um, and so lyricism plays a big part in, in the dissertation, yeah. I think. Um, and so I really enjoyed reading it. Having said that, um, your work does offer an opportunity to cozy up uh, with one another, which I really appreciate. Mm. But I want to acknowledge Dr. Anderson's point that it does, the dissertation does present us with some real challenges, at least to the Western, linear, right. rational, 
quantitative right. line, so to speak. Um, and I found that as the internal examiner, and the internal is supposed to have a role similar to the external, and we're supposed to bring different perspectives to the work and perhaps challenge you. Um, and so as I read through the dissertation, one of the things that I found was myself reverting to this rational mind. And I quickly found myself getting entangled uh, in all of your arguments and trying to find a way out. And then what happened next was these four people appeared at the doors of perception. And one of them was John Lennon and his three bandmates. And they rubbed on the doors, the windows, and the doors of perception. And John said to me, turn off your mind, relax, and flow downstream. Right? Another image of the river. Yeah. And if it wasn't, hadn't been for John doing that with me, I would have really had a challenge with your dissertation. But because of his generosity, I was able to literally just mm. relax into your work. And you took me on a journey. So where I want to start with the journey is on page one. And one of the beautiful pieces of writing in this dissertation is this. We're going to go each page? <laughs> Don't worry, 250. <laughs> happens when you write a big, long dissertation, my friend. <laughs> so, um, a lovely example of your beautiful lyricism is on page uh, seven, which is the first page. Mm -hmm. A philosophy of education is unfolded as I allow myself to follow the river's watershed. A philosophy of education is unfolded as I allow myself to follow the river's watershed. And where do you want to spend some time on this? This is my only question for this round. Tell us about that process. What is going on here when you write it's unfolded and that you allow yourself? What's this process of allowing yourself? Do you want me to talk about unfolding as well? And Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite books was by Deleuze. It's called The Fold. And he's dealing with, um, um, well, I can't remember now, another philosopher, <coughs> but talking about the folding and the unfolding. And he reminds us that uh, all of nature does this folding and unfolding, um, particularly the study of, of embryo development and also the study of plant development, right? There's a, a folding that unfolds and, and going on. Um, and if you spend time by rivers, they fold too because they're made of confluences of different flows that are coming in and they fold together. And um, then when you get to the, um, the delta, the way it was, it would break up into more uh, different unfolding and folding as well. We've lost all of that with the delta. Um, so the, the idea of folding to me is a really important tradition and a really important way to try to understand our relationship with the world, with nature but also with people. And that it, there's something inherent in the unfolding that was there but we didn't know it until it un unfolds. And I felt that in all the work that I've done with, with people Right? But also I feel that in connection with nature as well. That there's an inherent unfolding that happens in our relationships. But you cannot know them beforehand. And so that's the journey. That's where the journey comes in. And so by allowing myself to let this be organized by relationships that are connected with this river, a different structure emerged, and um, uh, and I, I have to keep a lot of stuff out just because otherwise it would have been three hundred plus pages. But there was this a new structure that happens by allowing yourself to connect to this thing that's separate from you, the set of relations that's separate from you, and uh, that en enables new unfoldings to kind of happen. You and I are speaking very philosophically here, but but um, 
Does that help? Sure, yeah. Yeah. And and so one of the things that you mentioned here was is you had to you had to come in fresh to the river, to the yeah. experiences, to the yeah. scenes, to to everything. Yeah. And so is that part of the allowing? I really want to zero in on this allowing. And I think that's such a powerful word that yeah. you've used here. Um, this process of allowing. So, and as a, am I correct in, in suggesting that what I'm hearing from you is that part of this allowing is that you you prepared yourself, in a sense, to just be open yes. and receptive, yes. leaving aside all preconceptions, assumptions, and inferences, and so on. Is that, is well, that right? well. Um, I, I wouldn't say leaving aside. I don't think that's possible, but including all of them, and including all of those plus others that other people and other relationships might awaken, right? And th and then there's an allowing. It's not it's not so much something I'm doing. It's something I'm allowing. Um, it's hard hard to talk about and hard to kind of articulate, but. Um, um, because I certainly wrote that document. Right. It doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel like mine. Ah, so that's interesting. It, it, it feels like something that was unfolded. Mm -hmm. And the writing process felt like uh, an unfolding process as well. So there are relationships that are important for us to enter into, to experience. But they're not given beforehand. We have to enter into those flows and we have to let them unfold. Um, does that help? Yeah, it does. And <coughs> if I can say, so you say you didn't, you weren't the, the sole author, am I correct in saying mm -hmm. that, of the document? Yeah. So well, I don't think so. Yeah. So, again, that, I find that really intriguing. Yeah. Really intriguing. I mean, you're really, again, that you're really throwing our rationality, our Western rationality, upside down and on its end sort of thing. So right. Suggesting that you were not the, the sole author of this document. Mm -hmm. And so that the it was an authoring, yes, uh, a dynamic ongoing process. process. Well, absolutely, and um, but that's not new to me. I mean, and my the primary authors that I leaned on uh, talk in this way and and did work like that. I mean, whether it's Lynn Hoffman, Deleuze, they talked a lot about this kind of thing. Or Bateson, Gregory Bateson. Um, I don't mention him as much, but he's all there, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That I, I don't think that I was doing something new, and all of those people spoke very um, directly about the craziness of Western authorship, mm -hmm. as if there's an individual can somehow own these things, right? And then that image of the Trinity, there's that fourth space where we all come. Mm -hmm. And so all of us are part of this, this kind of process. So, the, um, and I think in numerous places in this document I'm challenging that Cartesian element, right? The idea that uh, we can own mm -hmm. these ideas. They just, it, it, at this point it seems crazy and horrific to me to think that an individual can somehow responsible for mm -hmm. these ideas. So I don't think I'm new in that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. 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 And again, in the process of, of, of reading the dissertation, I, li I literally had to allow myself mm. to be taken downstream. Yes. And to just turn off this rational Western brain right. and just, just let it flow. Yeah. And, and I really appreciate that. So thank you so much for that. Can I make another comment on it? Sure. Um, if I'm really serious about the river, I, I can only open myself up to it and allow it. I can't control the river. Right? right? Um, I, I've got to be open to that river. Right. And that became very clear to me. And that even in the structuring of the chapters and the structuring of the document itself, it had to be true to the flow of the river and that river. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this will come up later, but another song reference for you. Uh, Foo Fighters, I Am a River. Um, How did I miss that? Yeah, I think it's a real <laughs> I don't know. You didn't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yes, for me. 
you familiar with the song? No, but I love oh, the Foo Fighters. Thing. I listen to it. And, the, and there's also a whole video that shows the production of the song. Yeah. So Dave and the others and the, and the Foo Fighters yeah. put a lot of work into the song. It's an anthem. It yes. plays in an anthemic, if you will, um, in the spirit of the classical composers. It, it really is an anthem. And it's got some, I think, profound existential themes flowing and through it. And it's a very subterranean, it's all about this underground river. Um, very subterranean, so that's oh, very wonderful. Cool that. so, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should burst out into song in a minute. How did I miss that? I don't know. A doctor we can. Hey, sorry. Uh, Do you mind if I stay here? It's great here uh, to be with you here. It is. Today. You too. Yeah. Um, so, just on the wake of um, the questions so far, unfolding. Mm. Uh, allowing and so on. Uh, I would like to hear you elaborate on your use of the word experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you uh, you title yes. uh, the three pieces yes. in the main body of the main corpus of the yes. pieces experiment. So I'd yeah. like to hear a little bit more about that. Speaking about turning off my mind and relaxing and floating the street. Thank you, Alan. Um, again, there's a tradition of, of using that language, right? And, and Deleuze uses it, and there was a whole bunch of others that did as well. Um, <clears throat> but for me, I felt I wanted to get away from this very modernist idea that there is a truth that I have to um, stand by. And, and be committed to, like a single kind of a, a truth. And I felt like our, our work, our philosophical work, should be experimental. We should be testing them out and seeing how they, how they work. And so the idea of a geophilosophy, for me, connected to the Fraser River, was, <coughs> was an experiment, was a series of experiments, was um, what, can we, what can happen if we take this, if we try this, what happens to our philosophy of education if, if we allow it to be submitted to the river, right? What happens to our <coughs> organizational leadership if we say that the river is more important than our flow charts, right? I mean, it's a lovely language, eh? But there's, um, <clears throat> and I think there, there are more people thinking like this than we realize, right? Where what is happening on the ground, not just the river, but all the relationships that happen on the ground. Um, my, my love for what Ward is doing is that these are ideas he's talking about, but they're on the ground and they're feeding hungry people and they're finding homes. And there's a lot of, they're, they're grieving a lot of loss, uh, uh, but it's on the ground. And it's on the ground right by the river, right by that Fraser River. That's, uh, Abbotsford wouldn't be there without it. So it's appropriate to think of experiment as a relationship that you're having with your, your reader. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you're, you're taking your reader downstream. Yes. So it's similar to Stephen Tolman's use of his idea of thought experiment. You would, I would have to, I don't know his work, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Well, th thank you very much, Chris. That's all for now. Thank you for the question. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Bye. Okay. It's all to be speaking to you right in front of me through my microphone. Is that all right? I can back up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware of Dr. Anderson, Charlie Anderson, on the other side somewhere. Um, so thank you. This is a fascinating journey yeah. alongside you. It has been. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to like, um, take the discourse to the uh, political mm -hmm. arena where power issues are being dealt with. I'd like to know if, from your experience, because you are you know, walking the talk, from your experience of, uh, um, well, you, you, for, uh, you, of course, lived within the various institutions. Your life, basically. I don't 
I don't know your history, but I don't think you've heard of it in yeah. time, right? Yeah. So what happened uh, to you? Um, what are some of the experiences, experimental experiences you've had in trying to live, um, live this way? The, um, Non-traditional, you're one of everything, non-rational, and there are all these labels, and I'm one of right. those labels myself. But something would have happened to you. Surely. <laughs> I have my set of those experiences within the process of education. You're organized to that. <laughs> and it's not pretty. Um, mm -hmm. So do you, would you like to share um, sure. how you navigated some of these uh, yeah, uh, I sure. I, I love questions like this because they're as much he soon story as they are my you know you've had your own journey in navigating those uh, institutions and um, uh, so have I and um, my friend Drew and I have had to navigate some of those together and um, I'm, I'm hesitant to go into too much detail on those, if that's all right. Just, yes, just no revealing uh, details, just give us Well, just because, um, um, well, many years ago, the concept of the rhizome became really important to me, and also the concept of the gift exchange, which I don't write a lot about in the dissertation here. But um, those were ideas that, as Lynn Hoffman said, turn over the human services industry, that they're not what's done, like, like they, they turn it over, they turn it upside down. And so you would get times when people would be very re responsive to those kind of ideas, right? To a work that's about the relation, if you're working with a, a family, it's about the relations that family has with the world that hold them up, that support them, that keep them alive, right? Not about the identification of pathologies or things that are wrong that need to be corrected, but the holding up of people into, into life and into the world in, in, in ways that heal and, and, and sustain us, right? That that idea is sometimes welcomed and at other times it's not welcomed at all. And so you would have this up, this, these times where you, you're doing this remarkable work and, um, <clears throat> and people are responding to it. And then leadership changes and it just ends dead like that. You know, happened over and over again. Um, and it had a deep effect on my soul and on Drew's soul as well, because we worked through this. And I think many of you here identify with that. Um, I didn't always feel that I was very successful in navigating those. At, at, at times I, I suffered great loss, great self-doubt. So in, in doing this, it's not like I found an answer. Maybe I wanted to get in. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Um, but I think one of the answers is to acknowledge the grief that we feel. Um, when those values are not held up, right? To, to allow ourselves to feel that grief, that sadness, that loss, and to make that an integral part of what we, what we have to deal with. Because uh, there's no easy answer, right? And it's, it feels like a constant battle against those ideas. At least it has to me. Um, um, and it's been associated with so much loss for me. Um, and I think, as I said, Drew is the one person that knows most about that. Maybe, um, we shared it, and his has continued as well. But to acknowledge that that loss is part of the structure of our world, and it's essential for us to feel that. And I try to acknowledge that in my in my dissertation at times, to just acknowledge that sense of loss and make it part of the structure of what we have to deal with. Mm. So quickly, uh, this, uh, when you have taken this 
stories to the river. What did the river say to you? Got to read my whole dissertation for that answer. <laughs> well, they have to too, because <laughs> that's what the whole dissertation's about. It's answering that question. You know, what does the river have to tell us? And and uh, the river has to tell us histories. You know, some of the loss that I felt is 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 is, is small. It, it, it's nothing compared to what Louis Sam and his family had to experience. It's small compared to what so many indigenous groups and communities have had to deal with. And so my loss is that I experience is not to overtake them, but creates a solidarity with those other losses. It helps me to appreciate and to understand these other losses that have been there. And there are other losses I hardly even touched on. I, you know, the um, uh, Ward and I have talked about this. The um, Chinese laborers who helped build the railroad. Many of them died. Where are they buried? Where are their remains? How come we don't know this? Right, so there's all sorts of losses that we can start to feel some solidarity with and, and to connect with. And, um, and I think to a great extent my, my dissertation was acknowledging those. To some, there's, but there's many I didn't. Um, and to my regret, not not regret that I should have, but my regret that I couldn't put everything in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Anderson, we're now on the second round, and we'll turn things back to you. Okay, and I'm not seeing my volume icon, um, so I hope this is not too loud. I have to shift it to louder to hear you and then the others and then move it back. Okay. It's fine. So, um, also just a comment, uh, Dr. McKinnon and I also had a question about uh, experiment because I, I tend to think of a dissertation as an experiment. It's, it's a laboratory in which one experiments. That aside, um, let's see, of my two other questions I thought of. Um, so Chris, if you were to expand what others might call at the end of your dissertation, conclusions are the so what question, please say briefly the main message are the lessons that you would hope that human service workers would take from this. Well, thank you. Um, it's a lovely question. And uh, there's numerous ways we can go with that. Um, but first of all, I would say, can we who are in the human services field, can we stop and think about our own relationship with land, with histories on the land that we're on? And for many people in the field, they won't see that connection. It's not evident, just clearly evident. But I would want them to wrestle with that question and to not let go of it. You know, what is the connection to the land and to the peoples that have been significant upon this land? And if you don't know the answer to that, keep at it. Because that is, is evidence of a certain poverty of thought that has been built up in Western academic realms and and in institutional ways as well. We don't ask ourselves this question in, in the human services work. What is our relationship to this land and to this river and to this ocean um, and to the histories that these, this land and this river and this ocean carry upon it? So that would be my first response, would be a, a call for people to take that seriously and if you can't find that connection right away, to stay with it and to, and to, and to find that. Um, there are other connections as well. Um, and uh, uh, Harleen, you knew my friend Lynn Hoffman very well. And yes. the river was a really important image to Lynn Hoffman. 
And it was important in so many ways. But one of the ways it was important is that um, in relationship to that quote I had from Deleuze at the beginning, how can we think about flows, about life as flows and meaning? Because as soon as we start to divide it up into stages or into segments, we've lost the flow. And um, how can we think about people and families and the, the, the sufferings that they are dealing with, as well as the joys they're dealing with, in ways that flow like a river? Um, and that's not an easy one to answer, because everything in our Western world divides things up. Um, ev almost everything. Uh, divides things up into segments and into pieces and, and the like. And of course, in our field, it starts with the assessment processes, which I know, Harleen, you've been very much against in your teaching, um, because it, because uh, um, they invite us to, um, again, divide the world up and divide people up, and in, in very um, negative ways as well. So, um, you know, I think we would be concerned with things like the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And, um, <clears throat> and we would have to find ways to, to allow the wholeness of people and their flows to become uh, um, more real to us. That's a couple of ways. Does that help? That helps. I guess what I continue to think is that your hope of the take-home message and what you would like to call people's attention to is so different in terms of the way that most people in human services or those that I meet on an everyday basis, yeah. the way that they think. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like a difference that's too big. So I... I and I'm not expecting you to answer this at this time, but I would suggest that you continue to give some thought to how you could present this in a way that people might be able to take it in and listen and have an understanding of it and find it useful. I appreciate That's that. It's not so different from people who want to stamp out problems and cure people on an everyday basis. Right. Um, can I respond to that? Of course, thank uh, you. Um, one of the things that has come home to me in this process is I expected a lot of resistance to these ideas. Mm -hmm. The reality is I didn't get much. I think people are ready for this type of thinking. I did get some, but not nearly as much as I, as I anticipated. So. I am thinking that people may be more ready for thinking about our work and our lives, lives in, in this uh, type of way than we might realize. That's my hope, anyway. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Arlene. Okay. Um, I, I, I. I want to follow up. I want to, excuse me. I want to follow up again um, from Dr. Henderson because I had the same question. Yeah. Um, or questions, and that is applying your work in both education and human services. Um, and you talk about finding the connection to the river and the land. Um, but I, I want to challenge you on that and push you further. And I think you've already done that when you talked about to the people and their flows, that phrasing you just yeah. used, which I think is really lyrical. But I'm going to return to the Foo Fighters. So here's the lyrics, part of the lyrics to their song. And this really touches on what I think yeah. Dr. Anderson is getting at. Um, there is a secret. I found a secret yeah. behind a Soho door. There is a reason. I found a reason beneath the subway floor. I found the water, the devil's water, and walked along its shore. Is that what you want? The channel's changing. The heart is racing from voices on a wire. The soul is yearning. The cold is burning. The ember starts a fire. 
Is that what you want? Is that what you really want? A river, a river. I, I am a river. I, I am a river. Can we recover love for each other, the measure of your life? Is that what you want? Is that what you really want? So. Can I just say something real quick? Please. Uh, after that, uh, I think we should just all go home. <laughs> going to uh, um, uh, draw upon some of the wisdom of the esteemed Heeson by Please. on this. And she looks very troubled by this uh, idea. Um, but um, I learned something from Heeson. Um, a philosophical idea, and uh, or at least it came to me when reading your material and talking with you, Heeson. Um, and in, in philosophy, um, we have um, epistemology. Right, which is how we come to understand our knowledge, right? We have ontology, which is the worlds that emerge in response to what you know we learn. And then there's um, um, ethics. You know, what are we going to do with this, right? How are we going to apply this? Um, it, with reading Hisun's material, I've come to the conclusion there's a step before that. And I think my dissertation is in that step before that. And in her work on contemplative inquiry, I first didn't get this because it was her work, most of what I read in her work is about um, Buddhism and, and Eastern ideas. And this isn't about that. Then it came home to me that, oh yes, this is about contemplative inquiry. Because contemplative inquiry exists with and after the ontology, the worlds that are, are unpacked. It's both, we're contemplating it, those worlds, but there's also a space between that so the, and, and the ethics. So the ethical response is, you know, excuse my language, what the fuck do we do with this, right? And I want to stay away from that. I, I don't want to answer that question. And for a number of reasons, because I think the, the contemplative inquiry is there to have people think about this and to invite others to answer that question. So, and this is important to me. So I did not want to be providing an ethical template. Um, I didn't want to be going there. And some people could criticize me for that. And it would be fair, because I didn't do that. Well, not much. Um, but I was unfolding worlds that we needed to contemplate and to think about carefully before we make our ethical decisions. I get concerned with how quickly, I, I, I call it the rush to remedy, right? And the rush to remedy is almost always troublesome. The rush to go to the ethics before we've done our contemplation. So if I was saying what we do with this, I would say we need to contemplate it. We need to live with it. And we need to allow the diversities of ethical response to emerge. Okay. Not one that I am di directing them to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. right? So that's where I would place the answer to that question. But what do we do with this? We have to put it in the realm where we sit and think about it. And we allow it without rushing to this remedy that almost always causes us more trouble. So, if I may, so the ethics are emerging out of the lived relationship, the experience? Yeah, but, but also with the relationship with the ideas that are here, that are put forward. I am putting something forward. I'm putting some, some thoughts forward that I think we need to think about. 
but I want to be very hesitant in rushing to the ethical domain. This is what we must do. It It happens every day. You turn on the radio, you go on the internet, all these memes and everything else. Everyone's telling us what we should do. Okay, so let me take it to education. Yeah. So I'm teaching a course in curriculum right now. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> not just the ethics, but what about prescriptions in terms of education? We, in education, we like to offer all kinds of prescriptions. This yes. is the way we should live. This. And again, there's yeah. an ethical dimension to that. Um, so how, um, it, it, well, first, before I get to this question, let me say, I want to come back to the first question, the first round of the <coughs> sentence about allowing. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like what you're suggesting is the allowing is a contemplative move. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's that opening and allowing. So I think I, so. I really, that's powerful. Yeah. I think that's a powerful message you have for us. Yeah. So can you give me just a, just briefly how might this unfold in a classroom? Okay. In terms of your pedagogical practice, your teaching practice, how might your work manifest itself in the right. classroom? Um, I want to find out how people are responding to this in the classroom. Right? I want to see what they're, where they're taking this and, and where they go with this. And I want to honor those places. Um, I don't want to prescribe them. I know that's what education always does, prescribe. I'm very definitely trying not to. Um, in very limited ways. There are, are some, I'm, I'm sure you can find them in there, but, but I, I want the, um, the classroom, I want those conversations to happen, and I want to see where the students can take this. And students take this places that you and I would never dream of. If we allow that to happen. If we allow it, right. yeah. That involves a lot of trust. Any comments? I mean, trust in the students, Trust in the whole process of it, of trust in your whole process. A lot, a lot of trust. I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure. But I mean, uh, what's the alternative? The yeah. alternative is a prescriptive. Yeah, well, I can't do that. Yeah, no, exactly. No. Yeah, I don't think you should. No, either. no, I know you don't. <laughs> and in my experience, the trust has been greatly rewarded. Yes. Um, and I, I'm guessing, would I be fair to guess it in your experience as well? Sometimes, not always. Not always. Um, but that's part of that experience. Right. We don't know. Right, we don't know. No. Right, right. Right. Uh, and, and that was the title of that song of John Lennon, Tomorrow Never Knows, which was yes. a malapropism from Ringo. That's when, That's how that song Oh, that's fantastic. Right? Isn't that amazing? Absolutely. And then I, I, let's honor Harlene Anderson, and, and where she talks about the not knowing. Right. And that importance of not knowing in our work. You know, right. I, I've always valued that. Yeah. It's the same idea. So I don't know how people are going to respond to this, um, but we can have conversations about it. I'm not removed from it. I can still talk with them about it. Um, but I'm, but I, the world is so much more beautiful when we let it unfold like that. Unfold the gate. There we go. Yeah. And I prefer a more beautiful world. So I prefer to go that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, I know you're there with me. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to acknowledge that your presentation, uh, including the, the six voices of your colleagues, mm -hmm. was uh, a very nice and palpable, palpable uh, demonstration of uh, rhizo rhizomatic Thank you. connections yeah. in thought and doing. Mm. Um, so uh, I was really taken by your discussion of laws, and I found that uh, in, in reading your thesis, there's a melancholy flavor, there's a melancholy quality to it. Mm -hmm. And so, just in response to Charles' mm -hmm. questions about the classroom, you know, if, if my mind turns to the classroom, I think of things like Paulo Freire's Pedagogy mm -hmm. for the Impress. But I think your work is more than a pedagogy. I think it's an epistemology. Mm -hmm. And I would call it a healing epistemology. Mm -hmm. And 
you needn't answer this. It's not really a question, but a comment. Mm -hmm. But you, you can speak to it if you like. But I'm curious about the, the healing quality of writing this dissertation mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Alan, your words mean the world to me, and just acknowledging that. Um, there is a healing, except that it doesn't heal. The melancholy, I think, is, is, is a requisite part of our life today. Um, and I think we have to come to terms with that. I mean, when we look at climate change and, uh, you know, all the things going on in the world today. I'm not inspired with hope, uh, but there is a melancholy there. And I'm interested in how we all come, how I and how others come to kind of, uh, to, to, to move into that, you know. Um, the beauty is, is when we start to gather together, is other things go along with the melancholy, like laughter. You know, we find reasons to, to laugh, you know. And then we're talking together, all of a sudden John Lennon enters the conversation, and there's something new and hopeful in the way that comes there. Um, I just appreciate your recognition of that. Um, I felt that this uh, writing, I'm 59, I'm not young anymore, um, and I felt like it was somewhat of a, something I needed to do to reflect upon my what's important to me in my own life, in my own history, um, and that my life and history are not about me. They're also on the land and the water, and they're connected to the histories that the land and the water have. And I think the land and the water carry this melancholy as well. Um, so it becomes a place of connection. It becomes a place of, of uh, we're together in it in some ways. But then along with it, it's punctuated with some grand laughter and some joy as well. I, I don't know, if I just, just talking in response. Appreciate your words. Yes. Um, thank you for the comments on uh, philosophy of education and the discussions we had. <clears throat> I just want to make an uh, observation a comment. Um, yes, uh, I'm with you about a particular um, uh, dominant um, understanding of ethics, mm. descriptive and uh, universalistic and yeah. all of that. But we could also put ethics with a small e in front of a whole bunch of other things. Sure. And, and it calls for action words. And I, yeah. I noted that there are many, many action words. That I think it's more accurate to call them movements. So this uh, turning over, folding, unfolding, right. wrestling. That's wonderful. Just wanted to comment mm. that your presentation is filled mm. with these movement words. Well, thank you. Yes. So there are movements, epistemological movements, as well as movements yeah. of action-taking. So, yes. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I mean, I drew these distinctions of epistemology, <coughs> ontology, and ethics. When it comes right down to it, they all mix together, don't they? Right? And you, we can take ethics in many different ways as well. But, um, Thank you for those words. Thank you. Well, now at this time, people in the audience who want to ask Chris questions, so that we can give the microphone to you. Is there anyone who'd like to ask a question? Yes, if we could all pass the microphone around if you may. Dave, do you want to go? We'll just do it sequentially. Hi, Chris. Hi. Thank you for your talk. I really appreciate your point about revisiting Christianity or revisiting our respective traditions. Yeah. It reminds me of 
uh, some of the work that I really like from Richard Kearney, who writes yes. anatheism. I love that. To yeah. atheist non-belief to believing again. Yeah. How do we do that according to your suggestion of doing that in a free-flowing way without segmenting into these sections? Well, that's a lovely question, and, and um, I feel my own life has done that. Um, I mean, I still could call myself an atheist. If, you know, as Jacques Derrida used to say, people could, I wish I could do his accent, but people could call me an atheist, and I suppose they'd be right, you know. Um, uh, but uh, thanks to people like Ward and, and Drew and others, is that I've been able to revisit that. But I have to go through the atheism in order to revisit what, um, what came, and I felt compelled to do this because um, um, what we consider as secular, the secular world and those ideas to me are, are, are just religious ideas reinvented, right? So we're constantly reinventing Christianity, and sometimes Christianity at its worst. And um, an example of that is uh, in the human services industry where we have to determine what's wrong and broken about a person, well, that's sin, right? Then we have to constantly put in laws and, and policies and procedure to order to deal with it, well, that's the law. And then we have to come up with redemptive processes whereby we can be redeemed from that. So um, I had to leave that, that was part of that um, turn to atheism, but it wasn't turn to atheism that's usually presented, it turns to atheism that is also in, um, I, I felt was needed in our secular world as well, um, where we could uh, we could challenge those other ideas that I just talked about. Um, but I was able to move through it, and I was able to move through it by meeting some wonderful people that held values that I could cherish, like Ward. I won't expect Ward to respond because he'll just be grumpy in his response. <laughs> um, and my friend Drew and others, right? Where the best of what I think Christianity can can bring is is brought back. And I felt it was important for us to do this because I kept seeing people want to turn either to Eastern ideas or to Indigenous ideas, and we just Westernized them over and over again. I mean, all you have to do is look at what's happened to the, for instance, to the concept of mindfulness or yoga. And they've just been completely westernized um, or are brought into that realm. But, but how is it done? I, I think we have to enter that journey ourselves. And I have my own story as I just shared on that. I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. But thank you for bringing that up. I love Richard Kearney's work. I was introduced to Richard Kearney's work through um, Amelda McCarthy, Harley knows her, who's uh, um, um, part of this wonderful group in Ireland, um, in Dublin, who have influenced me a great deal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chris, I find your uh, analogy uh, referencing and including mm. the river to be absolutely compelling. Um, and particularly the, the, the concept of, of flow that, that you obviously reference. Um, I'm curious about uh, how you might um, square the, the notion of flow as it has also emerged and been developed in psychology, particularly through the work of uh, Mihai, right. which I said Mihai, just please don't ask me to spell that. But uh, um, in the popularized notion, and it, you know, we have an idea, I think it's, it's Many people are familiar with it, a, a psychological notion of flow and in the zone kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yet your concept of flow is is much different than that. I imagine you had your own inner conversations about that nature of flow versus the psychological nature of flow. I wonder what, uh, if you have a, point, have a comment about that. Uh, well, I respect the psychological view of it. I, I, I have not spent much time with it. Um, and I, I instead wanted to 
present the flow particularly as related to the river and the Fraser River and, and how it can inform us, right? So I'm sure there's some wonderful connections there. I'm just not informed enough to give you a good answer on that. I hope that's all right. That's, that's perfect, perfectly fine. Yeah. Thank you, though. Okay, I'm going to risk myself here. Um, I feel a little bit out of my league, but I have some questions. Um, I'm, I'm a designer and a researcher in design and a colleague of Louise St. Pierre. Yes. Um, and I have also read much of Deleuze and Guattari mm. and has informed a lot of the work mm. that I do. Um, you referred several times to the image of the river. And my hand's shaking. Um, that visual, uh, I, I, it has me wondering. It has me wondering about the role of visuals, both in terms of images and also the words that we use. And um, the issues with that in relation to the rational mind and the way we sort things out. And you were asked quite a few questions about pedagogy, and um, though your your answers uh, resonated with me, I have been wondering about allowing and authoring. And I'd like to know what it means to walk by the river, in the river, mm. um, along the river. Mm. Things I love to do. Um, yesterday, in order to prepare for this, I'm in Vancouver. I live in Kelowna or in Penticton now, but I, I um, was staying at my brother's place, and I, I went to Iona Beach, where I'm in Vancouver. I go there a lot because it's where the Fraser meets the sea. It's also a compromise place because the, the. Um, the delta that used to be there is gone. Now we have dikes and we have dams and, and things like this. Um, but I go there anyway, and I walk there because I want to be by the river, you know. I want to be where the river leaves and becomes part of the sea. And if you, you've probably seen this uh, satellite image where the river, the muddy water of the Fraser flows out on top of the salt water goes all the way to Galliano Island, then goes north and goes south and dissipates. But I just want to feel that. I, I want to be present there. And in spite of the fact that this river has altered and has been changed, there are new ecologies that are there now that I can encounter as well. There are new birds and new creatures and, and, and new relationships that are there, and I encounter those. And it puts me in this crazy compromised place that uh, I miss what the river could have been there, but I have to recognize what the river now is there ecologically. You know? So these are the thoughts that go through my mind when I'm walking beside the river. I, I don't know if at all that helps. But yeah, I guess um, to me it's, there's something about mm -hmm. um, just the being there that, that I'm very interested in. Yeah. I'd be very interested in reading your thesis. Um, as opposed to the things we use to mark down. Um, they're very, it's very important, I think, but I'm very curious about um, what it means to let go of specific words and visuals because of the trappings that come along with it yeah. and how the, perhaps the work that you're doing sort of ties into that somehow. Yeah. Um, uh, and forgive me if I'm not directly answering them, but I'm kind of used, just going off your, your word. Um, like one of the words that I end up moving beyond is the word river itself mm. because I really followed a watershed which is much bigger than a river and uh, and the watershed, and, you know, I, I made my way all the way up to Jasper Park where the great, that's where the Fraser begins right there um, but also the river begins in, in the uh, in the rainwater that flows out of the streets in Vancouver. That's a part of the watershed. It's, you know, and some parts of it flow down to English Bay, and some parts of it flow down to the, the Fraser River. And so all of our words fall short, right? And they, um, one of the things I loved about Deleuze and Butari is they kept inventing new words. My, my, my mentor, Lynn Hoffman, did that too. Just constantly coming up with new language, you know, not to uh, uh, um, 
not to make it real, but to, to give us diversities of how we can think about these things. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful. That's good. Thank you very much. Yeah. It goes right by my daughter. That's my daughter right there. <laughs> and the one next to, to, to her is my son. <laughs> yes, my son's here too. I'll acknowledge that. <laughs> Arden. I'm returning to the pedagogical question. Yes. I think in part because after years of being an administrator, I've returned to the classroom and I'm teaching a course right now, so it's up close and personal. For yeah. Me. And I, I found, and so in, in referencing the pedagogical question, I want to I want to reference my experience of the learning yeah. from reading your dissertation. Mm which I confess is as yet incomplete. It's a long journey. If I, if I had my way, it would be the writing would be incomplete, too. <laughs> I understand. So I think that um, the rush to remedy has a co-conspirator called the lust for coherence. Yes. And I found in reading your work, what I needed to decenter was my lust for coherence. Mm. And Having done that, then uh, what it brought alive was first uh, when I arrived with Mary at the estuary. Yes. I experienced it anew because of your work. And not only that, I met you there. As I was soothed by the dampness of the mm -hmm. estuary and I looked down and I saw a heron standing in the mm -hmm. mud flats, I was brought alive in a new way. And the other thing that happened for me as a learner was that it started to evoke memories of other places that taught me, that were important to me, but taught me, mm -hmm. informed me. So it sort of brought the history of my relationship with place more alive. So um, what I end up wondering um, is about how to hold hands with people, mm. how, how to hold hands with one another as we um, decenter these two co-conspirators, that is the lust for coherence right. and the rush to remedy. Well, wonderful question. And, and, and you know, if I can reference my own teaching at City U, when I started there, you know, a lot of people thought I was, you know, had no structure and things like this. And now they don't. And it beats me why that changed. I'm not teaching any differently. Um, so I don't. So sometimes things change and move, and, and I don't really know why. Um, so, um, but maybe that partly your image uh, answers that, and that's the holding hands with people. That's like being with them, joining them being with them in their own joys and their own struggles and, and feeling very free about that and good about that and, and, and then they walk with you, right? And we, we influence each other. I don't, I, that's the best I can come up with that. And you already gave the answer in your... Well, I think, you're, I think what you're um, reintroducing though is the relational context of the learning yes, experience, yes. which was important in my learning. Yeah. I don't know whether I would have made it through my yeah. lust for coherence yeah. without the feeling, based on the history of our relationship, of your being at least prepared to hold my hand. Yes. So, and that goes to Charles's earlier thing about it's trust is involved. Yes. So. In that, in that that particular environment, you've established somewhat of a history yes. and a network of trusting relations. Yes, that's probably a good answer. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, they want to eat lunch. Pass it just around. If you just pass it around, and I want to just only doing this so that Dr. Anderson will have another question from the audience. Hello, Eliandra. Thanks, my friend. Um, so, I've been writing some notes here, and I wanted to hear your reflection of some of this. So I picked up a few. 
So you were talking about Deleuze and these other philosophies, with I think it's Leibniz. I didn't. I didn't bring him up, but yeah. yeah. But, but you they can. are talking about the Baroque philosophy. Yes. And the uh, of, of art and science. Yes. And I was wondering if this might be the tradition that you're, you know. I, I think about. so. And and then I was trying to say, well, how do we link this Baroque tradition with the postmodern philosophies, which yes. is what you and I practice when we are doing some counseling, the fun stuff that we do sometimes. Yeah. And, and I was thinking about this, this stance, for example, of not knowing yeah. um, in the writings of uh, Harleen Anderson, which we have, right. or the fluid identities instead of the rigid categories and pathologies. So that's bringing it to practice. And I'm also in learning, right, when we have, uh, or in teaching, how it shows up in expanding the questions to the students instead of responding quickly, practically, mm. which really um, will just, the search of the, of the students will stop, of yeah. us as students will stop if yeah. we don't have the answers. Yeah. So I think that's the richness, and yeah. I wanted to share Thank you. this with you. Thank you. Um, oh, it's Leibniz. Leibniz. Yes, that was the... Uh, who he's writing a lot about in that book, right? Leibniz in the fold in the book, and yeah, looking at Baroque thought. Yeah, yeah. so what do you think about the Baroque? Like, would that be accurate or postmodern philosophy? Um, uh, in the dissertation, I write about this a bit. I, I try to stay away from the language of postmodern, post structural. I do use the term post human a bit, and I do it reluctantly because it's kind of a new body of thought that I wanted to explore. Um, and one of the reasons I do that is those I admire, like Deleuze or, or Derrida, who are often put in that post-structuralist camp, for example, never use the term, right? And I want to allow, I think it's my decency almost, if, if well, I don't know if that's the right word, but to allow them to be able to speak on their own terms and to understand them in that way. Um, and I also found through the years that terms like postmodern, for instance, even in therapy, became like a new church, became like a new uh, religion that you had to subscribe to. And that really, in my history, kind of uh, didn't go over very well. So I, I kind of stayed away from that, that language. Um, I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. All right. Yes, please. Oh, I thought you did. I was hoping you would. Because <laughs> we go way back. We do. Uh, we go back over 20 years. Yeah. And I think it's more of a comment, really, as I, I listen and uh, just hold my hands up to you that so much of this is. I don't want to say common sense because that's not very common, but it's a felt experience. Yeah. And you've articulated that felt experience in a way that is um, accessible mm. to those who don't share that experience. Yes. And I think you've done it beautifully. And I think you've done it in a way that makes a safe space for people who don't have that shared yeah. your experience to take that trust, to mm. take that space and say, okay, and allow themselves into something that for many of us, that's been a long process of allowing. And for many yeah. people who are not in that, it can seem like a very high wall to yes. scale. And I think you've made a gate in that wall. And so I hold my hands up. Thank you. Um, and within a couple of years, I'm going to be sitting here as you're doing your. <laughs> That's Dana Lee, and she's doing her uh, doctoral at UBC. And language. Yes. <laughs> Keep doing it. It's good to have you here. All right, everyone. What we're asking you, asking you to do now is you could just uh, leave the room. There's the next oh, I'll tell you, just a great suspension. <laughs> We're setting this up uh, physically in our, in, or visually so that um, Dr. Anderson on the, the video can actually see Chris, the candidate, coming around. 
And uh, as we're ready here now. Okay. All right, are you? Yes, are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> Can I answer that? that cast a spell? <laughs> you know, feeling like a river? Yeah. And I see the hat that was mentioned earlier. Yeah, oh, good. You can see the hat now. Yes. Uh, Dr. Anderson did ask so that you, the, she could see you at this particular moment. Yes. So, uh, congratulations, Dr. Kinman. The university has four categories of completion of this. Uh, the first is, number one, passed with our revisions, or very minor ones that can be done with the senior supervisor. Number two is passed with... No, first is as is. As is. Number two is with minor revisions. And number three is with more significant revisions that involve possibly reconvening the committee again. And number four is rejection. Uh, the good news, Dr. Kinman, is your category number one. Is there anything you'd like to say in your new role as a doctor? Um, I don't know. No, I don't know. That's a good thing to say. Perfect. What was that? I don't know. You said the perfect thing. Oh, good. I'm speechless. Dr. Anderson, anything you'd like to say as we conclude this process? I would like to say congratulations to Chris, or Dr. Kinman now, and uh, thank you for your beautiful, beautiful dissertation. Oh. I have already underlined things that I'm going to reference in some of my writing, and I would like to thank each of the members of your committee uh, for my being able to participate with you in this process. And Arlene and Anderson, course, it was an honor have, having you on my committee. Did she hear that? I listened to the mic. Arlene Anderson, it was an honor having you as part of this committee. Thank you. Thank you also from me, Kisun. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for serving as the extra examiner. Thank you very right, much. Thank you. It would go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Anderson, thank you very much. We're going to conclude the process, and thank you very much for your time and involvement. And thank you. A good weekend to everyone. Thank you very much. All right, that is the end of the process, Doctor. You're oh, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs>